it, and it will never be like the Sampras days. It will never be like that. It's just, um, you know, I mean, you know, it's um, Eastern Europeans, especially the Soviet Union, they didn't, they couldn't travel. You know, way more countries, so the competition's a lot, a lot harder. I think that's one of the reasons why you don't see this domination. Definitely, money is not the problem. Our biggest challenge is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing that our country is so big. The bad thing is that because our country is so big, our best juniors don't practice against other good juniors or age. We're so far away from each other. Whereas countries like France and Spain and Argentina, two or three, two or three zero, uh, cities only, they all play right there. Even the professional players. I mean. In, in Barcelona or, or in Buenos Aires, you go to any any decent club and, and they run into, you know, some pro practicing right there and they watch him. I mean, you can watch Feliciano Lopez any day in Barcelona when he's home, he's practicing at the local club there. In the, U in the U.S., for a kid to, for a good player to happen to be practicing next to a top player, it's pretty yeah. rare. Players like, you know, uh, this is a daily, daily talk in the USDA. I mean, you bring that up with with uh, with Patrick Macron, he'll be like, "Oh shit, don't ask me that again." I think he'd be in the top ten. I mean, for me to say that he'll win a Grand Slam, man, I wouldn't say that about anybody because it's like the same three guys winning every Grand Slam. You know, those guys. Those guys are going to have to leave. I mean, those guys are going to be too old at some point. So I, I do think that Ryan Harrison has the character that it takes to be a champion. He's got that, you know, to be, I think to be that good, you you got to have that confidence in you, you know, and that edge that you can sort of, get through some tough moments and win some tough clutch matches and win matches where your match points down. He has that. He does have that. I mean, number one, the popularity in the country, and you can look this up. I think tennis is like the 18th most popular sport. You know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's some sports that are supposedly more popular than tennis that you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe it's like, like skateboarding or something. Like but it, definitely the popularity of the sport is not the same as baseball and basketball. For sure, the depth of the competition is higher. Yeah, the, the number... The number one team today may be as good as the number one team 15 years ago, but the number 50 team would destroy the number 50 team from 15 years ago. And then that's where you've seen the, the biggest difference is that the new wave of coaches, the mentality is you got to go out there and get those kids, you know. On the, we're on the road more. We're on Facebook recruiting. We're, we're on the website. We're looking at results. We're making phone calls. And you're, you're, you know, uh, you're sending your assistants overseas. We're traveling overseas. Before, there was no way. Coaches didn't travel overseas to go watch some players. You know, it was just different. It was, um, it was a different mentality. It was kind of like, you know, the salaries, the salaries have, have gone way up. Came to, you have some, I think the quality of coaches, the coaches has gone up. Um, you have guys leaving the USC as a national coach to become a college coach. So, you know, it's way more competitive. Um, pretty hungry young coaches. So the other is that as all these foreigners have been going back to their country, they're educating the coaches and they're educating the young kids there that college is a great option. You know, they go back and they're bilingual or they can stay here and have a great job and get a good education and, and, and promoting it. And then you have the whole, so many ex-players have started their business of college placement. And I mean, I can't tell you how many companies are out there. Their business is to place juniors into colleges with scholarships. 
it's a huge business business and they even they're still start with tennis and they'll go into other sports and that's getting more and more popular so I would consider myself and maybe this will answer this will answer your question my my statement is that I'm a reliable caring honest mentor that inspires those around me to be the best they can be and live life to its fullest. I personally would consider myself a mentor before a coach. Me mentor first, coach second. You could say that a mentor is a coach or that a coach is a mentor. I think a coach is more about the sport or is a mentor to me is about the sport and about life and I, a lot of times, I make decisions or I have talks with players with things that are not related to tennis but related to life. At the same time, what I think differentiates me to the naked eye from a lot of them, not all of them, there are a lot of great mentors that are coaching. Like I think Coach Center is also a mentor. My competitive advantage compared to 95% of the coaches out there is that I played on the tour, coached on the tour, I've been coaching at the top level, played at the top level, so I feel like, yeah, I can help a top junior get to the pro level. I don't think Djokovic has proven himself yet at that level. You know, I think he's had a great year, year and a half, whereas Nadal and Feather have had eight great years, or Feather has had eight great years and Nadal has had five great years or six years, you know. I wouldn't put Djokovic there yet because he hasn't proven himself. Between Federer and, uh, and Nadal, I think assuming there is no injuries, I think Nadal will be the best. And that's the first time I've said that I think I should, you know, I would, but I, at this point, right now, Federer is the best of all time. I just think at the rate